five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hi, space enthusiasts. How about accessing space, not with rockets, but with basically a big gun that shoots stuff into space? You may be surprised to hear that that is actually not a new idea. Our guests this week, the founders of a startup called WaveMotion from Washington State, are working on an updated version of it. Unsurprisingly, there is a strong dual use element in this too. We'll talk about all that and more in the episode. Enjoy. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with their CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help, expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hey, space enthusiasts, welcome back to another episode of the space business podcast. Today, I'm joined by Finn Van Donkelaar, the CEO and James Panner, the CEO, both co-founders of a company called Wave Motion. Welcome, guys. Nice to be on here. Yeah. Hi, Raph. Thanks to, uh, for having us. Sure. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. I mean, what you guys are doing is, is really kind of cool and interesting. So I'm really looking forward to, to this episode. Well, why don't we start there? Can you guys give us sort of the elevator pitch on what you guys are doing? Absolutely. So in a nutshell, Wave Motion is trying to solve the problem of launch. Uh, in a variety of launch applications, so moving a payload very quickly to a destination that you want, either from points to points on Earth or uh, from Earth to space, um, is very expensive and very difficult. And the main driver of this is the need uh, to use a large booster engine. Uh, whether or not you have a missile or whether or not you have an orbital rocket, uh, you're constrained by the rocket equation. And yep. so to get increases in speed uh, for your payload, you have to exponentially rise the... Uh, there's an exponential rise in the mass of fuel that you carry with you. So if you didn't have to carry your fuel with you, that would make launch simpler, cheaper, easier. And that is kind of the solution that Wave Motion is developing is we are looking into what we call a family of kinetic energy transmission technologies that stream energized matter. So you're essentially beaming the fuel to your vehicle to propel it forward, mm -hmm. um, pushing it uh, from the ground. And so you, all your fuel, all your talent, all your infrastructure gets left on the ground. And pretty much the only thing that's traveling in your launch vehicle uh, is your payload. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can kind of, uh, so we're supposed to be a non-technical podcast, even though I think <laughs> a lot of people listening to us, they do have some technical knowledge. Can you just expand a little bit? Um, to explain to people why this is so important. I mean, you mentioned the payload, but maybe talk a little bit about the, you know, the, the payload fraction that we achieve on traditional rockets, because some people might be surprised, you know, how little you can actually take. Yeah, certainly. It's usually between one and 5%. Um, and the reason for that um, is is just the, the simple rocket equation. Um, you need to carry fuel to get up to velocity, uh, mm -hmm. but then to carry that fuel, you need to carry more fuel. fuel. <laughs> and then to carry, yeah, exactly, right? You're, you're in a kind of a red green <laughs> race situation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the end of the amount of um, the, the fuel, the payload ratio that you end up getting is ultimately dependent on um, the specific impulse of your, your your rocket, which is to say, you know, how quickly you're, you're throwing gas out the back of your rocket. Um, and so if you just leave all that propellant on the ground and uh, shoot it at your vehicle, um, you end up kind of moving from, into a, a totally different uh, equation. Yeah. So to just add on one thing to that, um, this 
is something that people in the space industry are starting to really take a tough look at. Mm. Um, you have companies like Spin Launch. And just to give you an idea, though, of kind of how much this problem matters, Spin Launch says that they are reducing the amount of fuel that you need for an orbital rocket by four times. If you're mm-hmm. actually looking at that, though, in terms of you know percentages of the payload fractions, you still have this case where your vehicle is still 80%, 90% fuel by mass. You know, you're doing a little better than the 2% that you would get with orbital rockets. I think for Mm -hmm. uh, Rocket Lab's Electron rocket, the amount of payload to the amount of overall vehicle is about 3%. Mm -hmm. Um, But to really take advantage of uh, the rocket equation and to really shrink your fuel fraction, you have to be going very, very fast. And that's kind of um, what wave motion is trying to focus on is that we're really aiming for launch at close to orbital speeds. So that would be eight kilometers per second. Again, you have a non-technical audience, so very, very fast indeed. Mm -hmm. Mach 20 to 30, basically. Mach 25, really. Uh, I would say. Yeah, it, yeah. Thank, thank you for the explanation and and for our listeners. Yeah, it's um, like the guy says, it's the rocket equation, which um, you guys can look this up on on, on Wikipedia. Uh, I mean, the listeners, and this is actually a really interesting story. It was developed by a Russian math teacher in the 1890s, so before we uh, actually had rockets. <laughs> He worked out the theoretical foundation of, of space flight. And since then, we've basically used rockets which are um, constrained by this rocket equation, and which is why we also talk about the tyranny of the rocket equation. But let's delve a little bit further into the technology you guys are using, because I think in your elevator pitch, you were talking, if I remember correctly, about like kinetic energy transfer or something like that. How exactly does it work? Yeah, so we've got kind of two uh, two streams of technology that we're working on. One technology is the, the simple um, one that we're calling kind of the, the jet gun 1.0 technology. Um, and, and this technology is really uh, a rocket engine that you leave on the ground. It shoots out a stream of gas um, from a chamber that's pressurized to very high pressures. Um, and, and then this jet that's coming out of this rocket engine, it's, it's being shot up. Um, what you do is you just put your, your payload on top of this gas jet and the gas jet hits it and pushes it forward. Um, but that's not like a gun, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's very much like a gun. And this technology, um, uh, as you've been to it, is, is very high G-force, right? Because your, your jet, yeah. dissipates in the atmosphere very quickly. Um, but, you know, it has this great advantage of being really simple to build um, and it's totally suitable for military applications. Um, so that's the mm-hmm. that's the kind of technology we're working on right now. In the future, we want to do something a little different. Um, we want to do, uh, I, I guess we're calling it kind of the jet gun 2.0. And this technology, instead of using gas jets, would use uh, streams of small particles um, in the range of 10 to 100 microns in diameter, little spherical metal spheres um, that would be shot out at extremely high velocity like 10 to 20 kilometers per second. And the reason we want to use this, uh, even though it's much more complicated and much more difficult to develop than a jet gun uh, 1.0 technology, is that um, it doesn't have this property of dissipating the atmosphere. Um, Streams of particle, dense streams of particle jets have this sort of self-organizing property. They'll stick together in a long, thin stream um, for a very long distance indeed. Uh, And that would allow us to bring the G-forces down to a level that's appropriate for commercial launch applications. Gotcha. Okay, so so basically a gun and... so. I'm old enough to remember that I think it was Saddam Hussein basically tried to build a giant <laughs> space gun. Is it something along the same lines? Well, it's yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. So that that was a project by Dr. Gerald Bull. Um, that was the uh, Project Babylon gun, I believe. And that was his vision for launching things into space. Again, that's a form of kinetic launch uh, where you're right. giving a payload a very high velocity from the ground. So you have to carry less fuel with you to get up to orbital speeds. Um, and I think, though, that really highlights the uniqueness of our solution is that the the commonality between the jet gun 1.0 and 2.0, even though they work in uh, kind of different ways, is that they have no barrel or enclosing structure around the projectile. So as, as far as we know, we're the only company um, non-academic project that is working on a kinetic launch solution that doesn't involve some sort of long tube or a giant centrifuge or anything like that. It's more similar to um, the microwave beaming power experiment. So there were um, spacecraft that researchers uh, decades ago were trying to launch just using pulses of lasers or microwaves right. uh, to generate plasma underneath the craft, and that, that pops it up a little bit. So it's really more like that um, than a uh, 
traditional gun. And but for for the Jet Gun 1.0, uh, what the military sees in it essentially is a gun without a barrel. Uh, so that, that kind of has driven some of our funding choices right uh, right now. But yeah, so th- this is a long problem, you know, and we're not going to make the mistake of selling weapons to Saddam Hussein. So I think we're going to be good on that front. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I must I must admit now that uh, I remember the Saddam Hussein thing. I was quickly sort of googling it to to try to remember myself. That the other thing came up. It seems like the Americans and the Canadians had a project for a space gun as well in the 60s called Project Harp. Yeah, yeah, Project Harp, um, using old uh, battleship guns to to do uh, kinetic launch. Um, and, and that's that's a lot more similar to the, the Jet Gun 1.0 stuff. We want to be real clear on this point. Like this Jet Gun 2.0 stuff. The whole reason we want to do it is that um, it doesn't um, it doesn't result in high G forces. Um, we think that it would bring G loads down to something similar to an ordinary rocket, much more much more like um, what James was saying with like a laser beaming launch. Yeah, yeah, sure. By the way, do you know um, so Project Harp 1960s? Do you know why they didn't continue with that project? Oh yeah, simple answer to that. Uh, it's just a very low um, uh, exit uh, muzzle velocity for the for the projectile. You know, only like okay. 1,000 to 1,500 meters per second. Not really worth it um, right. for um, for orbital launch because you still need to carry most of your fuel with you. So that, right. it, it doesn't even substitute a first stage, basically. Yeah, yeah. It barely. It, I I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's barely even a, a first stage. I, you could look at the um, um, the separation velocity for a SpaceX first stage, which I think is, um, y- you know, there's a kind of a yeah. division. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think a SpaceX first stage is a pretty low separation velocity, so it's barely at the, in that range. Mm-hmm. And to get higher velocities, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. So uh, there was a small continuation, a subscale continuation, let's say, of Project Harp called Project Sharp, which was, you know, just Project okay. Super Harp, basically. Um, and they had to do uh, very exotic things in order to get their projectile velocities up. So when you want to start working with guns towards orbital velocities, you have to do things like start compressing hydrogen and kind of using chains of compression uh, because your projectile is limited by the sound speed of the gas. Um, that's propelling it. So you have to have a very fast, you have to have a gas that has a very high sound speed and that becomes very difficult um, when you're working with gun-like systems. And that, yeah, yeah, just, I can't uh, uh, speak enough to the advantages of a system where you don't have a tube around it because you're eliminating all this potential infrastructure and now you can extend your acceleration path. Um, And that's what reduces the G-loads. For your non-technical audience, you can think about it as the difference between a drag strip and a highway on-ramp. Our current technology and pretty much every kinetic space launch technology right now is more like accelerating on a drag strip. You get thrown back. There's very high forces. But uh, with this future jet gun technology that we're developing, it's more like a highway on-ramp where you slowly accelerate up to the speed that you want and get to where you're going kind of, you know, without being thrown back in your roll cage like you're a drag racer. Unless you want to. I don't know how you drive on the highway. But... Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that. That kind of depends on the on the, on the person. <laughs> <laughs> and so, okay, and this is why you guys are saying your, your G-loads are, because you mentioned spin launch, and I think spin launch is going like towards 10,000 G or so, um, which then requi- requires, um, uh, you know, some of the payloads to be what they call G-hardened. I guess where you guys are going, you could use regular payloads or they would have to be adjusted in some way. Yeah, that's correct. Um, originally, we wanted to uh, adopt this jet gun 1.0 technology with the gas jets for uh, for space launch, but just taking a hard look at it, uh, we didn't really think that it would be marketable with these high G-loads. Um, and, and inherently, the technology is always going to have high G loads just due to the dissipation of the jet. Um, so yeah, with the jet gun 2.0, we think that G loads will be in the same range than an ordinary rocket is. Okay. And so we're talking about sort of the SpaceX architecture and various stages. Well, frankly, any sort of um, traditional rocket at the moment is, um, again, for reasons of the rocket equation, um, a stage, what we call stage vehicles, right? Of a first or a second stage or sometimes even a third stage. What does your architecture look like? Is it straight to space or do you need like a traditional second stage? Yeah, yeah. Straight to space. Uh, the way we see it, there's uh, no point in um, trying to just replace the first stage. Um, I, I mean, to to have like, uh, if you're going to invest all this um, time and money in developing a, a totally new launch uh, system, you might as well um, go the whole hog and uh, get that thing all the way up to orbital velocity, or really beyond orbital velocity. Um, when you look at a, a system like ours, and this this is uh, research that's also been done by the Ram Accelerator Lab, which is yet another kinetic launch system. That's where Finn studied. Mm -hmm. Uh, during his graduate degree, it looks 
a lot more like uh, maneuvers for interplanetary um, travel than, you know, regular orbital travel. Um, but that's that's what you're doing, you know, is that you're taking advantage of the physics, the fact that you're going very fast. Um, you can perform maneuvers kind of taking advantage of the planet's gravity. I'm not, again, this, this might be too technical of a term, but the Oberth maneuver, um, where you're you're using the planet's gravity to increase your tangential velocity mm -hmm. kind of as you fall back down to it uh, is an important, um, is one way of gaining the uh, delta V that you would need while still having that very small payload fraction. And again, that's, that's not something that we studied originally, so I can't take credit for that. But the techniques and the orbital maneuvers for this sort of system to minimize um, to minimize that fuel fraction have been well studied in the past. And your systems architecture, I mean, is there a sort of a limit on what, what kind of payload capacity are you guys looking to achieve? Uh, we'd like to achieve a 50% payload capacity. I think that um, if we went with a conventional sort of aerospace construction for our uh, launch vehicle, we could achieve something more like uh, 80%. Um, but we'd like to make it more like 50% so that it's um, cheaper and easier to construct the vehicle uh, and so that we have a, a larger um, um, margin, I guess, for, uh, um, for adding systems to the vehicle. Yeah. And in terms of actual payload size, uh, we're definitely targeting larger payloads. So we would envision the first prototype system we build uh, by the end of the decade for launching about five to 10 tons of payload. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. The thing is, Raphael, that um, if we want to um, have a very long jet of these particles um, that we mentioned, you know, to bring down the the um, the acceleration on the vehicle, um, there's there's sort of a scaling going on here. Um, so we'd like to think of it in terms of the power put out by the jet, the kinetic power. Um, we think that in the range of um, uh, well, one to 10 gigawatts of kinetic power would be necessary to make a, a long enough particle jet. If you think about it, as your particle jet is, is moving through the atmosphere, it's losing energy to drag along the sides um, as it interacts with the air. Um, so, you know, as your particle jet gets um, more powerful, um, you can push uh, through more air before it runs out of energy. Um, so based on our CFD modeling and um, similar studies that we've looked at uh, in the in the past, uh, we think that it, it'd have to be minimum in that one to 10 gigawatt range. Um, so we have a sort of minimum payload mass to orbit and it's in that five or 10 ton range. And then so how big is the, just to get an idea, how big is the sort of ground infrastructure you need for that? For the actual launcher itself, it's actually quite small. Um, I would estimate um, just a, something in the range of a, um, a, a house-sized object um, for the for the actual launcher. But then for the actual energy storage, um, our current working solutions just have a, a tank farm of uh, of hot water tanks, um, and that would be. I don't know, maybe a, a one acre size tank farm. Um, Essentially, you'd be constructing a power plant that um, pulses for a brief period of time, the launch window of, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's very different, right? Because now instead of working with cryogenics and making sure that you're pumping all this sub-zero liquid everywhere, you're pumping very hot liquid everywhere, you're dealing with all of your energy. But the way that we figure it, it's easier to deal with all that energetic stuff on the ground where if something goes wrong, you can always you know, make an adjustment um, and save the vehicle. Whereas if something goes wrong on a rocket, you know, kind of with that same plumbing that it's carrying on board, you have to hit the, uh, what do they call it? The, the, you know, the bomb that they strap to all the rockets. I forget yeah, what yeah. the official the term is. The point of, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The launch. Yeah. Launch just to system. get into more specifics here. Uh, we, we mentioned that this jet gun 2.0 particle jet technology um, is electrical in nature. We need electricity to accelerate these little particles up to high velocity. Um, and, and so what we're envisioning here is a, sort of a, a fairly conventional steam turbine uh, power plant, uh, with the difference being that the turbine is optimized for uh, high power um, and relatively short lifetime and easy construction, um, as opposed to a conventional steam turbine power plant, which is optimized for extremely long lifespan more like, you know, 50 years of continuous operation. Um, so that helps, I think, a lot with the potential um, capital expense. And then I've mentioned the hot water tanks. We just take water, heat it up from these pressurized tanks, and then allow it to boil off into steam to run through the turbine. 
And so that kind of architecture, like what kind of launch cadence is possible with that? I mean, what, what do you have to do? So you like launch one, well, I don't even want to call it a rocket. Like you launch one set of payload and then what, what do you have to do then to launch the next basically payload? Just depends on how much power we have available to boil up the steam. Uh, so, you know, 10 megawatts in, you know, we could launch like one a day, uh, 50 megawatts in, launch five times a day, something along, that, along those lines. Um, that, that's all there is to it. Yeah. Similar pulse power experiments um, are actually present in uh, the field that I came from, which was nuclear fusion. Uh, so a lot of that technology is pretty well developed for shorter time scales. Um, but it's just a matter of adjusting your system parameters. So that way you're putting out or, and, you know, making a bigger system. Uh, so it's, again, it's one, of the, it's one of those things that has been done. And we just kind of have to adapt to our solution. Yeah, as much as possible, we'd like to stay close to a, a fairly conventional power architecture. Of course, uh, you know that one that one ish gigawatt range that's that's pretty standard for uh, for a large thermal power plant. So we'd be able to bring over a lot of uh, existing technology. So what what is the current status of all of this? Um, and I guess I could also ask in this context what the you know the, the TIL the technology readiness level is in your in your view. Oh yeah, super super low, Raphael. Super low. That's why we got the Jet Gun 1.0. Um, that jet gun 1.0, as we mentioned, we've already got it up and running jet gun 2.0. Geez, we don't even have a working prototype yet. Um, so once we, once we have something working, we're, we're definitely going to be showing that off. Yeah. Well, that being said, um, so the, the TRL technology of the, or of the, uh, jet gun 1.0 is at this point a solid five to six. Um, and we're seeing signs that we're going to start transitioning that product to its intended market of defense. And, you know, this is the space business podcast. So we're talking more about space. Yeah. Uh, the thing that's encouraging is that the same simulations and the same techniques that we used to prove the validity and the scaling of the original jet gun uh, seem to be working and proving very optimistic results for the jet gun 2.0, this electrically driven particle beam. Um, so we're seeing the, the path of the beam extending through, you know, kind of a background atmosphere and simulations, and we're not seeing as much dissipation as we would with the gas jets. And so we're, we're confident that if we build it, it'll work. Um, we're just still in the process of building it. Yeah. And so, I mean, so what you're doing, which is basically, you know, you, you have one product that's more advanced and then you, you know, have sort of another product on the horizon, which is similar, but, you know, has its own set of challenges. And then, you know, and then I guess you're going to use the sort of money you make with the first product to help finance the second product. That's not atypical, I guess, for other entrepreneurial situations. How are you guys thinking about sequencing that? Like, for example, if you're raising money right now, are you raising mostly on the, on the jet gun, jet gun 1.0 and then hoping that's going to generate enough revenue so you can keep pursuing the, the, the jet gun 2.0 or how are you guys sequencing that? Right. And, um, uh... It's a good thing that you asked about uh, raising money because we actually are raising a pre-seed round right now. Uh, so we're on Space Ventures. Uh, you, a few of your other guests, I believe, have mentioned that they're raising on Space Ventures. So it's a wonderful platform. Um, on our campaign so far, I think we've had over $138,000 worth of contributions. There's still you know, plenty of time for people to get in, of course. But um, I'd say wave motion strength. And this, this is maybe going back into our origin story is that um, Finn and I started this company when we were two broke grad students, essentially. And so rapid prototyping became the name of the game and not, not even fancy rapid prototyping with like 3D printers in a nice shop because the technology that we work with is very energetic. There's extremely high pressures and temperatures involved. Um, so it was more like, you know, finding whatever scrap metal we could bolt things together with mm -hmm. and uh, still have these things operate safely. Now, uh, the jet gun work, we were fortunate enough to win a contract with the Office of Naval Research, and that's what we're currently executing right now. That's how the company is keeping the lights on. Uh, so we have what's called an other transactional authority contract mm -hmm. uh, for $1.35 million to build a prototype of the jet gun 1.0 as a demonstration that it could one day replace artillery. So we're building this demonstration okay. prototype that has the same power as uh, these six inch guns, these 155 millimeter guns um, that the United States Army and the United States Marines uh, use. So we, we haven't had up until Space Ventures, uh, we completely bootstrapped the operation. And uh, that's that's kind of why we're optimistic about this pre-seed round is that if we can take those same kind of techniques, you know, grit, spit, and uh, determine determine this not to take any you know stuff um if we can get all that together we can build a macron uh, uh, jet gun 2.0 
prototype um, that demonstrates the effect that we want. And uh, kind of looking more towards the future in the next few years, we do see uh, needing to raise a seed round to kind of scale up even a bit more. It's a question of how fast we want to accelerate the second uh, stream of the technology. And the answer is we want to because uh, space is happening now. Um, but the the defense side, that kind of first product, uh, we've we're, we've been fortunate enough to already get going on it and to be nearly self-sufficient uh, with its development as long as it's being supported by the military. And so just to be clear, so the defense stuff, that's the JetGun 1.0. And then the space stuff, what we've discussed so far is JetGun 2.0. And it seems like, so you guys don't have any plans to sort of do a interim space version JetGun 1.0? No, not as far as uh, we can see right now. So the, the question, again, uh, is how much money could we potentially make in the space launch market? If we're limited to launching things that can only take thousands of Gs, uh, the answer is it's not a very expansive market. Maybe in 20 years from now, um, when really, you know, there's uh, full-scale colonization of low Earth orbit and beyond, yeah. um, when you need more supplies. But even then, uh, heavy lift launch rockets, I'm sure, will have caught up. Um, yeah, there's no not much of a place in the market for it. So Yeah, believe me, it's extremely tempting to build a jet gun 1.0 and try and get mm-hmm. something up to uh up, up to that orbital velocity because yeah. we, we know that we could do it. All we gotta do is compress a bunch of hot hydrogen and throw it through a, a rocket engine, and then we'd we'd have our high velocity jet gun 1.0. But we we just don't see a um a future for that in uh, commercial launch. And so the reason you don't see a future is is like you said, you think the the the, the G forces just make it unviable. For most customers, yeah, yeah, that's our take on it. Okay. <laughs> now, but we may we may do a few high altitude launches with the jet gun uh, to suborbit just to test kind of how fast and how far we can get things with that um, system, but not not an orbital space launch. No. Yeah, we mentioned we mentioned military applications. Of course, military is interested in hypersonics. Um, so you know, although we might not go to orbital velocity with the Jet Gun One Point there might be an application for it uh, going up to the Mach Five range. Yeah, so I guess um, this theoretically also sort of interim use, right? So instead of putting stuff into space, you mentioned hypersonics, um, and also instead of delivering ordnance, is, is is this something that could be used to just deliver something else point to point? Oh, uh, for the Jet Gun One Point yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, I guess we haven't thought about it that much. I, I mean, we're, um, we're we're pretty set on just the Jet Gun 1.0 being a, a military product and the Jet Gun 2.0 being a more civilian product. Um, there is though a, a nice uh, manufacturing application for the Jet Gun 2.0. Um, when you have that that stream of particle jets um, of uh, particles um, at higher velocity, they're extremely effective as a cutting tool, sort of like a water jet cutter, but much more efficient um, <clears throat> in terms of material removal rate. And then at lower velocity, you can do cold spray additive manufacturing uh, with it. This is a space business podcast. I guess I'm not going to, don't want to get too much into it, but uh, that's what we see as being the sort of interim <clears throat> way to, to make some money with the jet gun 2.0, you know, before we have to build this giant launch infrastructure. Well, yeah, it, it is a space business broadcast, but this is actually, we see in some other companies as well, you know, which um, face similar issues that the space use case may be a few years out and you have to, you know, like you said, you have to make sure you keep the lights on in the meantime. So this is actually, yeah, yeah. from an entrepreneurial point of view, this is, um, these, these stories are quite interesting to hear. But so how, how do you guys, I mean, you're still a small team. Um, there's potentially quite a few avenues to pursue. How do you guys do this time-wise? Are you guys, I would assume you guys are mostly focused on the military opportunity right now. And the rest is sort of a little bit on, I wouldn't say, don't want to say the back burner, but probably receives less attention, right? <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Yeah, that's, that's definitely mm-hmm. true. Um, especially because there are parts of um, the contract that are a little more intense than others, as you can probably tell. Uh, We're in one of those more intense spots. Uh, So there's a lot of work that we're doing right now with the Navy project. Um, I, you know, not to toot our own horns too much, but Finn and I do work uh, very hard on this. You know, it's Mm -hmm. pretty much all day affair. Um, When, yeah, we, we, you know, we have facilities just now on uh, my property, you know, essentially my garage, we're looking for expansion. Uh, It can be a lot for a small team, but at the same time, I think that we leverage our time very well. Um, We do, again, rely a lot on uh, collaborating with the military and our uh, team on the uh, Office of Naval Research side has really helped accelerate the jet gun research. Um, But then there there are things, so 
when you look at the physical properties of uh, this new jet gun that we're building, there's a couple of different elements that need to go into it. Uh, kind of focusing on testing one thing at a time and that division of labor. So while Finn does more of the CFD stuff, because that's where he came from um, with his uh, hypervelocity acceleration background. I focus, say, more on the electrical engineering side because I'm a little more familiar with um, the power stuff, you know, the pulse power stuff uh, from my background in nuclear fusion. So that is kind of one one secret, I guess, is just making sure that the right person is doing the right thing. And even with a small team, uh, you can get a lot done. But, but again, we're, you know, it's a midnight to midnight schedule mm-hmm. as well for us. And we are definitely looking at... Um, when when we finish raising this pre-seed round and possibly soon go on to raise a seed round, uh, looking at not only expanding our facilities, but expanding the team. Yeah, absolutely. First things first, probably a machinist. Gotcha. And I should have asked this before, but since the, 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 the clearly your, your, your Office of Naval Research contract is, that was a very important achievement. Um, so again, sort of like, you know, kind of giving lessons to other people listening, many of whom I think have ambitions to start space companies. How was it to get in? How to get that contract and get into the office of naval research? Like, for example, did you guys answer to a sort of specific call, or did you guys like show up there and say, "Hey, we have a cool concept for you know a better type of artillery"? Or how did that all work? Uh, so you know, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. So breaking into uh, military and DoD contracting can be very difficult, um, especially with the type of contract award that we were given. So the other transactional authority. Uh, is more like a prototype contract that's given out to uh, larger companies, but they've started using it for small companies uh, to get more leverage than the SBIR program provides. Maybe some of your listeners or some of your previous guests have mentioned the SBIR programs. Uh, those are kind of mili- those are kind of research grants um, that, while still our government contracts. Uh, they're not the same vehicle as we're working with. Um, so the, those SBIRs have a lower barrier to entry. I guess what I'm trying to say, it's a little unusual that we scored this OTA contract. Um, and that uh, that part kind of relied more on luck um, than mm-hmm. the average one. So one of our professors at University of Washington, Finn and I started this company. We started working on the jet gun together in 2018 after he invented it uh, in his basement and was showing me like this using 44 Magnum shells to um, fuel the original handheld kind of size prototype. Mm -hmm. Um, Very, very loud, (laughs) especially for his neighbors. Um, But uh, one of our professors kind of studied what we were doing. We, you know, we talked about it and he found this a very interesting problem. And so he started introducing us to people that he knew in the military that were looking at launch problems in various contexts. Um, and we started talking with someone from Office of Naval Research and we pitched them, you know, we pitched them again. I think we pitched them a third time even. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And once once they kind of understood what we were doing, they pointed us to the opportunity. Um, again, it's not, it's not like they gave it to us directly, um, but it is very difficult to know what opportunities are out there without talking to someone. I don't know if any if there are any listeners out there who have ever tried getting in touch with a uh, technical point of contact for a research grant or for a contract, you know how hard that can be. So get really getting in front of the right person who owns the problem and showing that you have the medicine to that pain point that they're feeling, you know, just, just the same as any other startup. Even yeah. if you're, you know, talking with the military and you're talking about making missile launchers, um, you, they still have a problem and you still have a solution. And that's the way that you have to uh, approach it. And yeah, we, we formally applied for the contract opportunity once we were kind of pointed towards it. And uh, we ended up winning it because of the potential that this technology has. When did, and when was that? When did you guys win it? Oh God, that was like early, late 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's a- yeah, that's w- welcome to welcome to uh, federal federal contracting. I, I think we uh, that, that was late 2020 when we uh, okay. had that. Yeah, we were we were given a notice of award um, in summer of 21, but we didn't formally start the contract until uh, just before spring of 22. So there was a good eight month start, but that that's, yeah, that's a good point. I think that Finn made is that that's something you have to be prepared for is that when you're a startup working with the military and working with the government in general, timelines uh, can be slowed down quite a bit. And that's sort of um, runs counter to the philosophy of a startup, which is to move fast and break things. So you really have to strike a balance between, you know, how fast your customer is willing to move and how fast you can move on your side. 
Yeah, absolutely. And luckily for us, you know, small team, low costs, um, we were prepared to wait. But I, I think for uh, another startup that maybe has a, um, a shorter burn time than we have, uh, it'd be it'd could potentially be ruinous. So you got to look out for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good point. No, re part of the reason I'm asking is simply because so, so you guys won this actually a long time before the, uh, the, the current, uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? Which probably only increased the uh, interest in this technology, given how artillery heavy this, um, this war is. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, we, we do, um, we did take advantage of, I, I think there's this, this force design 2030 thing that, um, the, uh, us Marine Corps is doing where they're, um, what's the word? Oh yeah. They're, um, moving to more mobile sources of long range precision fires. Um, and in, in English, that means, um, that they're replacing, uh, most of their artillery. Um, so, so that was kind of a pre-existing kind of push from within the, the military that we took advantage of. But as you said, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has certainly uh, increased interest uh, among VCs for uh, defense-related startups. And I mean, I mean sp speaking of um, geopolitics and strategic competitors, I mean, is is this something, to your knowledge, have you are you aware of other nation states kind of going for similar concepts like you guys are pursuing? No, but I wish they would. We might get more funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. Coming back to the space side, I mean, I know this is a difficult question, but sort of from uh, since, since the Jetcon 2.0 technology is so early on, but, you know, right now for what the launch costs, you know, on a Falcon 9 for ride share, we're like $5,500. Um, if you take the entire rocket, you're, I don't know, probably 2500 roughly for the Falcon Heavy or like below 2000 mm -hmm. Starship. I mean, who knows, probably a few hundred dollars and Elon would say like a few ten tens of dollars. Uh, what do you guys think you're going to come out with this if it works in terms of cost of like one kilogram of mass to, to a low Earth orbit? Uh, we want to be competitive with uh, with Starship on that. And I think we can do it because we have uh, sufficient um, uh, margin on what we uh, think we want to do for a launch vehicle to have stuff like uh, a metallic heat shield, for instance, um, uh, that would allow us to do very rapid reusability at very low cost. Okay. And so talking about the timeline, so what what is the timeline between where you guys are now you know, doing mostly the work with um, for, for the military on the Jetcon 1.0, and then an ultimate potential orbital orbit capable Jetcon 2.0. Like, what are what are the main steps, and like, um, you know, what are the, the years that go along with that? Right. So, uh, definitely, the orbital launches of large payloads with the Jetcon is something that we would see closer to the end of the decade um, rather than uh, in the next few years. But in the next year we are focused on building at least a very you know small subscale proof of principle prototype of the macron beamer i me i mentioned there's a couple of things physically that need to go on jet gun 2.0 uh, jet gun <laughs> yeah sorry so yes. there's we there's an we're, we're doing some branding shifts yeah, right yeah. now um, <laughs> so it comes up, yeah so <laughs> apologies by macron beamer i mean jet gun 2.0 that's a okay. little a little too technical of a term um so for the jet gun 2.0 uh within the next year or so we anticipate Kind of showing that we can shoot these high velocity particles um, through the air and uh, have them not dissipate as much as a gas jet would. And the particle velocities that we'd be looking at um, would be ones that fin that are suitable for those manufacturing applications. And then kind of you turn up the velocity by cranking up the power, cranking up the voltage. Uh, and we can do that with that same subscale. So we could we should be demonstrating that within the next year or two. Um, within the next five years, I'd say, we would probably be doing orbital velocity launch demonstrations with a larger system. So not a launch to orbital velocity because we have the problem with power and scaling. But with a small prototype, you can at least shoot you know, a little dummy projectile to eight kilometers a second. And that's a demonstration we definitely think is possible to do within the next five years. And then from there, once we've shown that we can shoot something to orbital velocity, we would raise the money to uh, build this orbital launch facility that's actually capable of sending up big payloads and keeping them in orbit because uh, you'll you'll have a booster, uh, not a booster, but you'll have an, a um, orbital maneuvering system. Yeah, that's the right word for it. Not a second stage, but an OMS. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be within uh, 10 years, kind of that timeline. 
Yeah, and, and that's just the space related stuff. In the in the background, of course, you know, there's also the the defense contracting work, which we see as our mainstream of income for the next uh, probably five to eight years at least. Yeah, yeah. Again, kind of focusing more on the space side uh, first. There, we have the vision for the Jet Gun 2.0, but what's actually going to keep the lights on and start bringing in money is scaling up this defense work as well. Uh, so the contract that we have right now has an option uh, to be non-competitively selected for a phase two follow on. And if we get that phase two follow on and successfully execute it, uh, there is a transfer for a sole source award, you know, to like say United States Marine Corps strategic command or something like that, they would ask us to build enough jet guns to outfit a platoon or something. Um, and that's something that both, uh, ourselves and our, uh, team at the office of Naval research see easily happening in the next five years. Yeah. And that's as really- long as there's no military budget cuts. Yeah. And, and that's, where the big bucks come in uh like for instance uh n triple seven howitzer is I, I think average is what like three or four million a pop um yeah. so so that's where the, that's where the big bucks come in yeah I mean, military budget cuts probably anywhere in the world seems something that's at least at the moment is pretty unlikely <laughs> yeah yeah exactly with the, with the situation <laughs> and i think it's good you know because both the the military and uh private capital are realizing yeah. that you have to um pu- put innovation you know in defense i think that uh that a sixteen Z associate uh, said that democracy demands a sword. Uh, you kind of have yeah. to use innovation as your hammer to so- forge that sword. Yeah, hammers and swords. That's what we're selling. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, you see sort of basically pure military companies like Anduril getting massive venture financing. So, you know, right, exactly. Kind of like, I think and, the venture and community the, woke up and, and realized that, like I said, democracy needs needs a sword. That's that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And there's the manufacturing applications that Jet Gun 2.0. We're we're not counting on on that in our in our budget um, estimates at all or our, our projections. Uh, but uh, who knows how much money that make? Good stuff. So as we're winding down on time here, let me ask you some closing questions. Actually, one which I should have asked at the beginning. I forgot. Um, what's what's the origin of the name? Why is it called Wave Motion? <laughs> Uh, James, you want to get this one? Sure. <laughs> uh, well, you know, ostensibly when we were starting out, it's because uh, the jet gun 1.0 produces this barrel shock, like a shock wave, and it's putting things into motion. So wave motion. Uh, but then there's there's sort of an inside joke, which I guess is not so inside anymore, uh, which is that Finn and I are uh, fans of uh, vintage science fiction, including uh, Japanese animated science fiction, also known as anime. Mm-hmm. And there is a... Um, anime series from the 80s called Space Battleship Yamato. And their their big weapon, the thing that they fire, you know, when things are desperate is the wave motion gun. And so (laughs) we figured, you know, we built our own wave motion gun. And so that became... Uh, wave motion gun was too unwieldy uh, for military personnel to say, so we just ended up calling it the jet gun at their suggestion, but lived on in the company name. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's a shame. I like the anime name. And there would probably be some good sort of like artwork for potential like uh, design and logos to go along with that. From the <laughs> yeah, exactly. Subject One to copyright anime. restrictions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but having having gotten this out of the way, let me get to my sort of usual um, final questions. Um, if you guys weren't doing wave motion guns or jet guns, what is there something else you find really fascinating in the space sector right now that you would pursue if you had the time? Uh, well, Stokes work is, is pretty interesting. I like what they're doing, um, mm. with their, uh, their launch vehicle is, uh, really neat stuff. Um, so keep, keeping up with them has been, been pretty cool. Yeah. And I guess on my side, if I had never met Finn and started wave motion, I would just keep going into nuclear fusion. Uh, I'm really interested in these smaller reactor concepts because I think that's more viable, uh, than the giant power plants that they're build prototypes that they're building like at Eater, the, uh, Tokamak, um, so I might work for Zap. Uh, interestingly enough, there's another company raising on uh, Space Ventures right now uh, called Princeton Satellite Systems. Yep. I, would, I would think about doing work with them, honestly, if Wave Motion didn't exist. If I saw them, I might fig- I might uh, ask about getting a job with them. Because and Zap Energy, you know, around the corner as well. So probably working with one of those guys. Yeah, and that's um, uh, nuclear fusion propulsion, which of course is another really really sexy thing to think about but let me get to my typical final question and since you guys were talking about anime already um there's just science fiction you guys like science fiction and if yes what are some of your 
your favorites? And it could be oh, any yeah. books, TV, movies. Okay, James probably has a pat answer. I'm gonna need to think for a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, for me, I, I love science fiction. Uh, I was that kid in high school, always in the library. Um, and my favorite author is uh, Robert Heinlein. I just mm -hmm. think that, you know, he kind of, the interesting thing is that he had books for all ages. So he had what are called the Heinlein juveniles. And you'd read about like teenagers, like having adventures on other planets. And then you get up into the, the heavier adult stuff as you grow up, kind of stranger in a strange land, starship troopers, moon's yeah. harsh mistress. Yeah. Uh, so I really like Robert Heinlein. He's easily, easily my favorite. Um, especially because he focuses so much on the societal aspects. You know, it's it's great fun to like read about someone writing the technical aspects of a hyperdrive. Um, but ultimately, we have to live in the society uh, that this technology ends up creating and exploring that social side was something I really like about Heinlein's books and still like about Heinlein's books. Yeah, I'd go with uh, uh, Larry Neven and uh, Jerry Purnell books. Mm. Those are always great. Football, <laughs> big fan. Mm. Yeah, I also like football quite a bit. Finn fin and I have kind of similar tastes, as you could guess. Gotcha. Good stuff. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. And, you know, best of luck with first the Jetgun 1.0. And then, you know, I hope you guys can get on to Jetgun 2.0 as, uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Raphael. Pleasure to be here. And that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an interesting space story to tell, or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. See you for the next episode.